back in a minute. Where is that located? Um, south side near the airport. Is it a big congregation? It is. It is. 
Hey, how you doing, sister? I'm good. How are you? Doing great, Russ. My name's Chester. Chester or Teresa? Teresa. Teresa. Teresa? Yes. Like Mother Teresa. Okay. Yeah. Y'all have Wednesday night service? Um, Wednesday night, Bible study is online. So they still do virtual Wednesday night. Do they have Sunday night too? They don't have Sunday evening service. It's Sunday morning. So the church starts at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Bible study in church or? How big is it? Uh, maybe almost a thousand people. Maybe eight hundred people. It's pretty big. Mixed? No. Brookhaven. Yes, I do. That's where I live. Oh, okay. Yes. So yes, they just moved to this side of town a couple of months ago. So usually on Sundays I go to Brookhaven. A lot of people from Brookhaven go. Huh? A lot of people from Brookhaven go there. You get to talk with him a lot? Huh? You get to talk with him a lot? Uh -huh. How many elders? How you like Brookhaven?
praise the Lord Jesus. So we just sung those praise to God for his many acts of creation. If you didn't know the words of this song in the third verse, fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines pure. Fairer still the Jesus.
flee, and take your rest later on. See that the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayal is at hand. While he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man who sees him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you can do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest to cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as, as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, that all the disciples left and fled. In this scene here, we have Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, with his three beloved disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they are separated from the other apostles, who are at different locations in the garden. Judas has already departed, Jesus is a little further away from the three, and he's in deep, agonizing prayer. He is alone. Peter, James, and John are supposed to be keeping watch, but they are sleeping. The single event that brought him to earth is about to happen. He is about to be separated from the Father for the first time. As his whole mental, moral, spiritual, and physical suffering that he is about to endure is beginning. He says to the Father, Father, this may be too much for you to bear. Is there another way? Let this cup pass from me. Let's think about this. Is there possibly another way? Jesus knew what had been planned, but now he was experiencing the agony. Was it more than he anticipated? In the same plea, he says, not as I will, but as you will. Will is the power of choice, deliberate action. Jesus' will may be wavering at the moment ever so briefly, a strong reminder of this man. He is asking, can I handle this? Yet his obedience to the Father quickly comes forth when he says, I will do what you want me to do. In other words, God, I know your power and what your choice is. Jesus himself is uh, emphasized to Peter that he had options in verse 53. Do you not think that I could appeal to the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels? He had an ultimate decision to make. Jesus would do what God wanted immediately, the death and sacrifice. However, can you imagine 12 legions of angels descending on this band of soldiers and Jews? Just think about what one angel of God did to 185,000 Assyrians in 2 Kings 19, verse 35. Considering that episode, the thought crosses my mind how awesome it would be to have witnessed such an event of divine intervention, yet I'm thankful that Jesus didn't choose the option. Jesus understood is that we, you and I, do not have an option. A few hours later, Jesus died on the cross. He lived and died experiencing the horror he had dreaded and which he had prayed about. If it was Jesus' will to do the will of his Father, what should our will be today? Should we not also say in any circumstance that we find ourselves in? Not my will, God, but your will. We must always do what Jesus did and make our will subservient to God's. As we were taking this memorial this morning, we should remember Jesus' submission to the Father's will. Let's pray for the bread. Father, we give thanks for this bread in remembrance of your Son's body, that out of perfect obedience he surrendered to be crucified for the sins of the world. May we learn from his example to become a better servant of your will for us. In Christ's name we pray. Father,
will say in majesty. That'll be after Bill speaks to us. And before that, let's stand and sing number 19. All hail the power of Jesus' name. So I was incredibly thankful for the example that she has set over the last month and a half. 
conversations and stuff I've, I've had with her. And, but I'm, again, it's just happy uh, to see her and, and to know that she's with us. All right, so we're wrapping up uh, our series of lessons, or I'm wrapping up my series of lessons, ours and mine, uh, on discovering Jesus of Nazareth. And again, I know there are a few sermons ended maybe, I think, two weeks ago, but our year is still going on, so we still have our eyes fixed on Jesus. Our eyes still do it, maybe. We didn't have Christ. To come and see who he is. And so over the last seven times, the last seven times that I've preached, I've tried to, to spend time looking at different images of who Jesus of Nazareth is. And we looked at him as God, that he is God. Son of God. If we say in prayers for Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah. The anointed one that came of God, the prophet, the priest, and the king. That Jesus is the prophet that fulfilled the Deuteronomy 18 prophecy. That he is the servant of the Lord from, from the book of Isaiah, who will serve the Psalms. That he came to serve mankind and to serve the Father. That Jesus is the Lamb of God who died. Again, to redeem you and to redeem me and to show us how awful and how terrible our sins are. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I fix my eyes on Jesus, Jesus can seem a little bit distant. Not because of anything he's done, but because of how great and how just absolutely incredible he is. And I think about, again, the fact that he is God, the fact that he is the Savior, that he's the Redeemer, that he is all, just all those things. And there's a temptation, I think, to think that Jesus is, is unapproachable. And so for this last lesson, I want to spend some time discovering Jesus of Nazareth. But Jesus as the Son of Man. Now I'll say this uh, preemptively before you come to me after the lesson and say, well, in Daniel chapter 7, listen, I understand that a lot of the Son of Man imagery uh, comes from the Daniel 7 prophecy. And that, but, but let me just say, this is the term Jesus uses to describe himself more than any other term. And whenever he calls himself something, it's usually Son of Man. And it's possible, maybe probable, that he's mostly like thinking about that Daniel Set an idea, but I also think that part of it that he is he's trying to say, I am human. In fact, that wouldn't matter. You know how I can tell you that is because in the Gospel of John, at the resurrection, one of the things he's trying to help Thomas and the disciples see is, hey, look, I'm real, I'm flesh, and I'm blood. In fact, a little bit later on in 1 John, in the, the whole book of 1 John, John is trying to help them understand. In the beginning of the book, John will say, that which we heard, that which we touched, that which we see with our own eyes. Why spend all this time trying to convince you that Jesus was a real person? It's because I think sometimes we think, well, he was, if he wasn't a real person, then it excuses me to do whatever it is I want to do with my body, with my life. He's not, he wasn't a human like me. So he doesn't understand, he doesn't get it. But uh, Jesus was a real person who lived, and we started every time and again. So for the last time, at least here, who was Jesus? His story. He was born. He was a human being. God come down in, in the form of man. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. He grew up in Nazareth of Galilee. He was the son of a carpenter. He was followed by a small, unremarkable group. He went from place to place in the Judea area teaching about the kingdom of God. And then he was crucified by the Romans for being one who creates insurrection. And in Hebrews chapter 2, we've been in the book of Hebrews quite a bit, but in Hebrews chapter 2, the Hebrew writer would say that since the children, being us, mankind, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise also partook of the same. He likewise also became flesh and blood. So here's going to be the outline of the lesson. We're going to look a little bit in the book of Genesis at what was God's original plan for man. If Jesus had to come down... It was to show us what the plan originally was. At some, at some point, we'll see this in a little bit, but at some point, man messed up what the image originally was for, for, that God had. Then we'll look at Jesus the man. What was he? Who was he? And then the purpose of Jesus' man. Why did he come? Why, why was he born a man? And what was the intent of all of that, at least uh, from that scope, from that angle? So hopefully you're there. Genesis chapter 1. I'm not, but we'll get there in a second. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, this is the sixth day of creation. God has made everything except for man. And starting in verse 26, we'll read what verse 26 to 31, the text reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, 
according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Do you know this, by the way? God, God's intent for mankind, as God makes man, he makes everything, in fact, everything he makes, he speaks it into existence. And then in verse 26, it's almost like the Genesis account slows down. And God says, let us make man, it's almost like, by the way, we know that God is like a genius. So God thought he had a plan. He thought all of this through before he started to create. But in verse 26, it's almost like he gives extra attention. He gives extra thought to the making of man. So then he says, let us make something, man, in our image, according to our likeness. And then in verse 27, we'll say, he made man in his own image. In the image of God, man was created to be God's image bearer in the, of the world. That man was originally a mirror. <coughs> That's, that was the idea. You're supposed to reflect an image of something. And we we see that even a little bit kind of here, you know. I think about my kids. My kids, you know, some of y'all say they look like that, which that's fine too, just your fault. But like kids look like their parents. You can for the most part look at the kids here and kind of sort of guesstimate who their parents probably are. You know why? Because that's how you were made. You were made, you reflect. Even from birth, there's a sense of, I guess not from birth, maybe you don't look like your parents at first, but Pretty early on, there's a sense where like kids reflect the image of their parents. And more than just like physically they reflect the image of their parents, but as the kids grow up just a little bit, you start to see the comportment. And you start to see, oh, look, you start to sound just like that. You start to look just like mom. My mom just does this exact same thing. And, I, and again, I think that's because as people, we were ingrained to be that way. We were ingrained to reflect an image. And from the very beginning, the image that we were ingrained to reflect was the image of God. That was his intent. You were created to bear God's image in the world. But not just that, as you read the text, which you also see uh, in the verse, is that man was created to have dominion over all creation. That God, when he made man, he made man with the intent to rule. That God made man in the very beginning to multiply the likeness of God. I, I, by the way, I think, you know, we, we can take Genesis 1 and be fruitful and multiply. And I do think part of that is, again, the world is empty. He's trying to fill up the world. In Genesis chapter 9, a very similar command. But I think if you consider what the world was like in Genesis chapter 1, the world was, it would have just been filled with theory. People who were made in the likeness of God. And so whenever God says, be fruitful and multiply, what is he multiplying? He's not multiplying humans. He's multiplying the likeness of God throughout the earth. You, kind of, you see that picture there? In Genesis chapter 9, when the, when the command is repeated to Noah, what has just happened? Well, the flood happened and wickedness was wiped away. And so then again, be fruitful and multiply, fill the whole earth. It is both fill the earth with people. But I think more importantly, the bigger truth is fill the world with the likeness of God. That whenever man was made, man was made good. And not, not like how we think good, what we call everything good. But man was made good with the absence of evil. There was no evil in man. There was only good. This was the original intention that God had for mankind. That man was made with the ability to continue to choose said good. Man was made good. But man also was made with choice, with free will. And so in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, whenever man falls, God says to Adam, he says, because you have listened to the voice, you had the choice and you chose to listen to something else, to someone else. But originally, man was created good and was created with the ability to continue to choose the good. And if you've read the Bible story, if you've read Genesis chapter 3, you know what happens at the fall is that man chooses something else. And so as Paul talks about the, the, uh, the fall of man in Romans chapter 5, notice what Paul says about what Adam does and how Adam fails 
on the original plan for mankind. He says in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man, that one man being Adam, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not, is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the effect of Adam, who is a type of him, or who is a type of him who was to come. Do you notice, by the way, Romans chapter 5, as, as, as Paul is talking about the failures of Adam, that, notice that the things he describes about Adam's failure, that in fact, Adam's failure almost becomes an uncreation. That everything that God does in Genesis chapter 1 to make man, in Adam's sin, Adam like undoes all of that. That Adam was created to multiply the likeness of God, and instead, what gets multiplied? Because of Adam. It's not the likeness of God, it's sin. That Adam was made with the ability to choose good, just as God chose good and continues to choose good, because it's his nature, and instead he chooses evil. That Adam was made to have dominion over all creation, and in fact, whenever you read Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, instead of Adam having dominion over all creation, what seems to have dominion? Death does. That in Adam's failure, Adam ruins what God originally intended for man. And it's not just that Adam ruined it and then we came and we were great. But Adam ruined it and we all followed in step with him. That was kind of the end of that Romans chapter 5 verse 14. That he, you didn't sin in the same exact way that Adam sinned, but you also, the folks there, but you also sinned on this side. But you also sinned. That's, that's the image there. Because he says in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, you know what God wants from you. You know that he wants you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And you have failed to do that. We've all failed to do that. We've all sinned, and we've, and we've all fall short of God's glory. And so then Jesus comes. And so then Jesus comes. And in Hebrews 2 and verse 14, and then in verse 17, the Hebrew writer will say, speaking of Jesus, that therefore since children, children share... In flesh and in blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. That he had to be made like his brethren in all things. That Jesus became a human like you and like me. But in some ways, not like you and like me. And we'll see that in just a second. But Jesus was made like us. In what ways? Though? This is just a short list that I can pop. Like, this list is not the, like, the, the exhaustive list of all the things that you could possibly say. But Jesus was made like us. Jesus knows what it's like to be born in a fallen world. In fact, the world that he was born in, children were being killed for nothing that they've done. This is just the world that he was born in. The world that Jesus was born in, people were falling into temptation. And in fact, Matthew chapter 4, he was also tempted. The world that Jesus was born in, for a time, he had some unbelieving family. Like, he knows what that's like. At least for a good person. Like, you read Mark chapter 3, they think he's crazy. They think the lifestyle that he's living, they think he's gone out of his mind. You read a little bit later on in the Gospel of John and John chapter 7, they're even prodding him a little bit. Why don't you go up? Go show yourself just a piece of food. If you're, like, for, there was a time when he, he understands what that was like. That Jesus knows what it's like to be ridiculed just because of people's ignorance. And again, people were saying things about his conception. People were saying things about the things that he said, and he knows what that was like. He was made like us. Jesus knows what it was like to be let down and betrayed by the people closest to you. And in your darkest moment to be by yourself, seemingly alone, he gets what that's like. And Jesus knows what it's like to unjustly face death. The things that at least deep down inside as humans make us boil more than anything else, some sort of deep injustice, Jesus gets it. And so the Hebrew writer would say about Jesus that he partook in, in, in flesh and in blood. He partook of the same. And the reason why he partook of the, the same is that so through death he might render him powerless who had power over death. That is the devil. That Jesus became a man to show you what it was like to live and to overcome the devil. So that we couldn't say to God, but God, you don't get it because you're all the way up there and you don't know what it's like to be down here. You don't know what it's like to be one of us. You don't know what it's like to fear. You don't know what it's like to suffer. You don't know what it's like to cry. God, you don't know what it's like to lose things. And he can say, absolutely, I do. Which, by the way, he does because he's God. But almost to remove the excuse from us, he became man to say, I absolutely know what it's like. You know what it's like to lose a loved one? I lost Lazarus. You know what it's like to have people leave you? The 12 who were with me for three years left me. 
You know what it's like to suffer? I get it. I know loss. I know pain. I know disappointment. Jesus gets it. And so because of that, he is able to come to the aid to those who are tempted. That whenever we're tempted to think, Jesus, you don't get it, he absolutely does. In fact, a little bit later on, the Hebrew writer will say that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Because he was tempted in every way. And he succeeded. Yet without sin. That Jesus comes to restore the image of what God originally wanted for mankind. That he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Now, whenever you look at Jesus, whenever you, we keep our eyes fixed on him, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing God himself. That Jesus is the one who has all dominion. Remember, we mentioned originally that God, that God made man to have dominion and to rule. Jesus is that. He has all dominion. He comes up and he says, therefore, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And then he tells him to go and to baptize people in his name. That he has the dominion that God originally wanted man to have. And that Jesus, I think, when you think about the Great Commission, you think about 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he shows us what God originally wanted in multiplying his life. Yet it wasn't be fruitful and multiply and have children. I think it's be fruitful and multiply and make more people made in the likeness of God. That's the real, that's the real blessing. That's not the real aim of all of that. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, Paul writes and he says, We all, with unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. That you're being remade in a different image and now into the image of God from glory to glory. That Jesus, again, came to show us what it is to be man. And when I'm saying man, I'm using it like the sex-neutral way. That he comes to show us what it is to be human, to be man. And so that has nothing to do with being born with status. Because where was Jesus born? It has nothing to do with how much money you have in your bank. In fact, people wanted to follow Jesus and he lets them know, I don't have anything. A lot of Jesus depended on, at least financially, the people around him. It has nothing to do with having some white collar job. He was a carpenter. That's not what makes you a man. That's not what makes you a human. It's how much you accomplished in the eyes of the world. It has nothing to do with your popularity. At the end of his life, there are very few people with him. It has nothing to do with your physical attraction. Because again, the book of Isaiah would say in Isaiah 53, there was nothing about him, at least not about his appearance, that would have attracted people. He wasn't formally educated, not, I mean, he would he'd go to the temple, he was reasoning with them as a kid, but I don't mean like he wasn't, he didn't sit at the feet of the Pharisees the way that the Jews would have thought, this is formal education. He didn't go to Rome to study. He wasn't married. That didn't make him any less of a man. He didn't have kids. And so when we think about what it is to be human, what it is to be a man, to be a human being, Jesus comes and shows you that it has nothing to do with this. This was never it. That being a human being is being made in the image of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 21, when he's talking about don't walk in darkness, and he's trying to help them understand you need to walk in light, he says, if indeed you've heard and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. The truth about everything, not just the truth about salvation. We know that already. You're aware of that already. If you read contextually the, the following verses, you'll say the truth about how to treat people is found in Jesus. The truth about how to relate to people is found in Jesus. That the truth about everything is found in the person of Jesus. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the seed, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. Which is in the likeness of God has which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That what it is to be human isn't being the best version of you. You know that, right? God isn't trying to turn you into the best you. The best you would still fail. The best you still wouldn't be good enough. That what God is trying to do is make you something completely different. Renew you into a completely different image. And that that image is the image of Jesus Himself. That truth is in Jesus. Whenever you fix your eyes on Jesus, you see that truth about everything. This is what real life is. It's him. In every regard, everything that he does is the true way of living. Every way that he treats people is the true way of living. Everything that he says is the true thing. That truth is in Jesus. And you see that in his life. You see it from a kid, what truth in Jesus is. That he's worried about being 
in the in the house of God. He's worried about God's business. And you see what truth in Jesus is, and he's subject to his parents. When he himself is the son of God, he could look at Mary and say, Mary, what are you talking about? Come on. What do you know? The truth is in Jesus. He shows you what it is to be subject to your parents. He shows you what it is to work. The son of God, would you imagine those first 30 years when he's working as a carpenter? And you know you have a dream or purpose. You know you've got some real big things to accomplish and you're being a carpenter. He shows you what it is to work. Jesus shows you what it is to fulfill all righteousness. You look at him and you see the truth about what, what resisting temptation looks like. About how to be a student of the word. Again, as a child, he's going to be spending time, he's reasoning, he's talking to people about the word. He shows you what it is to spend time in prayer. Deeply, all the time, in all circumstances. Whether you're busy, or whether you're alone, or you're going to face something serious, he shows you what it's like. To be a man of prayer. To have passion for purity. For personal purity and for religious purity. And a lot of times, he goes into the temple and he's frustrated because of what's going on. And he's like, this isn't true. And he defends the truth. And Jesus, though, he, he, he came and he was going to be bringing a new covenant. He wasn't just disobeying the law because who cares about that? He was a law-abiding citizen. That he was a friend. And a friend, you might say, the people who were clearly beneath him, because he's God. He shows you what it's like to be compassionate. He shows you what it's like to be a servant. To use whatever influence you have for good. To forgive people while you suffer. And to be someone who seeks to win souls, the truth is in Jesus. That it's always been in him. And so again, we're moving on from the theme this year of eyes fixed on Jesus. But don't you dare take your eyes off him. You cannot. Because if you put your eyes on anything else, it's now a lie. Truth is in Jesus. So much. <clears throat> and again, he decided to come to redeem you and redeem me. Have you ever thought about that? Why would God do that? Listen, humans have this way of thinking really highly of themselves. It's part of our curse, I think. But comparatively to God, we are absolutely nothing. That bug that got close enough, I just watched it. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just being honest. It's just a bug. I don't care. The gap between us and God is big. That's not what he does. Go to Psalm 8. To wrap up. The 8th Psalm. It's actually what gets referenced in Hebrews chapter 2, whenever the Hebrew writer talks about Jesus becoming a man, sharing in our flesh and blood, becoming like us. In the 8th Psalm, it's a Psalm of David. And it's a Psalm of praise. It begins and it ends with praise. In fact, the end of Psalm 7 kind of finishes with this call to praise, and then Psalm 8 begins with more praise. But Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who has displayed your splendor above the heavens from the mouth of infants and nursing babes? You have established your strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. And then here's the question, the question when I think about Jesus. David says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the work of your fingers, the stars and the moon that you have ordained. What is man? That you take care of. The son of man that you care of. Why you? Is it that you're so special? God is so special. Jesus said, I've got to become like that. What is man? The song continues. It says in verse 5 And you have made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the fields, the birds, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. But then verse 1 and I think verse 9 give us the why. Verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name over all the earth. You know why Jesus came in the form of man to show you that truth is in him, to show you how to live? It was for God's praise and God's glory. To show how majestic the Lord that we serve actually is. It blows my mind, in fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, 
in like verse 14, Moses writes and he says, Lord, to you belong to the heaven and the heavens of the heavens, and yet you have placed your heart on mankind, on Israel particularly, but if you allow me to broaden it out, on mankind, and you compare us to all of creation. And it wasn't because we're great, it wasn't because we're mighty, it wasn't because God saw us and he was like, man, all this value on you, you're just phenomenal. That wasn't the picture. It was for God's name's sake. And the reason why Jesus came, the reason why Jesus became a man, is to try to restore what we ruined in creation for God's name's sake, for the sake of God, that God's name is majestic. And so whenever we allow ourselves, whenever we choose the good, choose to be remade in the image of Jesus, what we're doing is we're joining this song that David was singing this in the eighth song. Is we're talking about how majestic God's name is, about how great God is, and how the plan that God had to redeem mankind. In a second, we're going to sing majesty. And we're going to talk about praising the majesty of Jesus. The majesty that he deserves. Even though he became a man like us, he became a man, but he was also fully God. And he continues to be fully God. He deserves our majesty. He deserves praise in our worship. Because he came and he lived and he died to redeem. And to give you, to, to redeem the value that we can go to God through our sins. If there's anyone here this morning who has seen their life and seen that they've been following a bunch of lies, they want to be in the name of Jesus. You can be baptized, we have water. And as the New Testament will say, you're becoming a new creation when you do that, a new creature. You're not being baptized to be a better you, you're being baptized to be a whole new person. Mm. To be someone that God originally intended you to be. To be made in God's image. To be someone who is, who is filled with the goodness of God. Walking in righteousness and in truth. To be someone who has the ability to multiply the likeness of God. With him. And to be someone who has the ability to choose the good. We can help you in any way. You can come forward as we stand as we say. Father, we come before you recognizing you as an 
awesome, powerful, loving, merciful God, a God whose name truly is majestic. And Father, we're humbled that you've chosen to have a relationship with, with us, a fallen people. As a matter of fact, we know that you seek after those that worship you in spirit and in truth. So this morning we pray that everything we've done here has been in accordance with your word and in a pleasing spirit. Father, we're so thankful that we have this church that we can come together with other Christians and, and read from your word, to study from it, to sing songs of praise to you, to worship you in accordance with your word. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for the deacons and the elders. We're thankful for the evangelists here that proclaim your word so well. We're thankful for the other Christians here. We brought, Father, we pray that, that uh, we would support one another. Weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that rejoice. And Father, we know that there are those here that are struggling with, with physical ailments. Father, at this time, we're particularly mindful of Diane Cottle. We pray that you'll offer her a speedy recovery after her recent fall. Father, we, we're mindful of those members here that have had family members that have recently passed away. Father, we're we're mindful of the Buda Lazy family. We're mindful of our brother Joseph, our sister Teresa Evans. We, we pray that you'll extend your comfort to them. We pray that you'll help us to know how to help in those passings. Father, we're especially thankful at this time for, for your son and the sacrifice he offered on, on the cross on our behalf. It's through that sacrifice that we understand that you can hear our petitions and, and, we, and, and know that you, you hear them. And Father, we pray that as we leave this place, that we'll live lives that reflect that sacrifice to the world. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I think I, it's in the book, right? It's in the directory? Uh, I haven't been telling the movie yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll be here, um, yeah, I'll be here tonight, all right? Okay. Okay. All right, brother. All right, brother. I'll see you tonight, all right? Appreciate you. All right, take care. Hello, Chester. Hey, how you doing, brother? All right, how are you? Doing great, bless. Good. Good. Great to see you. Brother? Yeah? yeah? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Alright, let's try to do it. Thank you. 
Spanish brethren. So, Chester, this is Mr. Jack here. He wants to uh, yeah. go for it. You don't need to help him. You know, oh, can't see. Hey. How you doing, brother? Glad to meet you. Very good, sir. So, did you learn anything this past week? No. In your educational efforts. I don't care. You did nothing good for you probably worth a lot. Okay. Well, we'll see what you're willing to cough up and then we'll spill the beans. Okay? Have a good week. We're pretty full today, weren't we? Thank you. Yeah, it was pretty full. Let me get this to Haley. Haley knows to come get it right there. Oh, okay. Just leave it there. What happened to Teresa? Her mother passed away. Got a ways to go up. Thank you, brother.